Welcome to my channel, where there are interesting and equally sensational stories. Listen to today's story before I married my husband. I was involved in a month-long affair with my now father-in-law, Phil. The affair came to an end just two days before our wedding. Since then, I've been a faithful and devoted wife to my husband, and my love and respect for him are paramount. On the last day of our affair, both my Phil and I realized the gravity of our actions. We knelt, prayed, and sought forgiveness from the Almighty. We vowed never to engage in such behavior again and promised each other to keep this grave mistake a secret. Over the years, things seemed to have improved, and I had pushed this dark chapter of my life out of my mind as if it had never occurred. My current relationship with Maya File resembles a typical father-in-law slash daughter-in-law relationship, although it might be somewhat distant. I haven't been in a private setting with him since that time, and we haven't had any private conversations. All our interactions with him have been in the presence of my husband. My in-laws live quite a distance away about a four a half hour drive, so we only get to see them around three to five times a year. Now here's the situation. During the Christmas holidays, my married adult daughter attended a gathering with her sister-in-law, Sil. Her Sil and brother-in-law, B. Il, had recently taken one of those genealogy tests where you send in DNA samples to trace your ancestral roots. They shared the results with my daughter and her husband. My daughter was truly intrigued by these results and thought it would be wonderful to trace our family's origins back to the early days on the East Coast before our westward journey. She was so enthusiastic about it that my husband decided to order kits for our entire family. Our family is on the larger side, with more than five kids still living at home. Now the dilemma here is that I'm not entirely sure whether my, my husband or my father-in-law, Phil, is the biological father of my daughter. However, there's no doubt that my husband has been a loving father to her. So what I'm wondering is should I wait until we receive the test results? If it turns out that my husband is the biological father, then I won't say anything. But if he isn't, should I have a difficult conversation with him and tell him the truth beforehand? It happened just two days ago when we had that conversation about genealogy testing. And since then, I've been struggling to sleep or eat properly. All those painful memories of the affair which I had buried deep down for over 20 years, have resurfaced to torment me. I've always had this desire to confess everything to my husband, but I knew that if I did he would divorce me. And our marriage, even through the church, would be annulled. You see, I hadn't been completely honest with him about my past experiences. Eventually, he discovered the truth, and he found it in his heart to forgive me. However, I'm certain that he wouldn't do the same for this revelation. I understand that God expects me to be truthful, and I'm aware that by keeping this secret, I'm perpetuating an ongoing sin. But I'm torn because I don't want to shatter my husband's world and bring an end to our marriage. What do you think I should do? Sincerely, feeling desperate and full of remorse. Update. I'd like to clarify a few points based on the questions I've been receiving in your responses. I won't provide more specific details to protect my family's privacy. My husband is older than me by several years, and I married him a year after graduating from high school. I worked for my father-in-law, F. Il, for a year before marrying my husband, whom I met while working at his father's company. I initially told my, my husband he was my first, even though he wasn't. Before him, I had been with two other men. He discovered the truth after we were married when one of my former boyfriend confessed to him out of guilt. I then revealed the existence of the second man. Upon learning that he wasn't my first or second, my husband contemplated divorce, but I dedicated myself to him and proved to be a worthy wife. Eventually, he decided to stay in the marriage. However, he didn't fully trust me and required me to demonstrate my dedication for five years before we expanded our family with more children. We went on to have multiple children over the next 11 years. I was 19 at the time of the affair. While my Phil was over 50. He was a hidden alcoholic during that period. I was with my husband who was my fiancé at the time, before I had the affair with his father. 
We had been dating for nine months. During this time, I was with my Phil on four occasions. My estimated conception date aligns with two days before our wedding. On that day, I was intimate with both my Phil and my now husband. Additionally, I had been with my husband the day before and the day after. I'm uncertain which man might be the father, but lean toward believing it's my husband. My Phil and I have never discussed the affair since ending it. We both made an agreement to block it from our minds as if it had never occurred. Update. I want to express my gratitude to all of you who responded. After careful consideration, I've decided not to inform my husband about the affair and to let the genealogy testing situation unfold naturally. My daughter and husband placed the order for the tests last night, reigniting the topic of discussion. As far as I know, it will take over a month to receive the results. Therefore, I have some time to contemplate how I will handle the situation if it turns out that my husband is not our daughter's biological father. In the meantime, I'll continue caring for my children and looking after my grandchild. I also recognize the need to prioritize my well-deserved rest as I've been sleeping very little since this ordeal began. The upcoming month will undoubtedly be challenging, but I'm determined to persevere. I plan to maintain a sense of normalcy in my life and trust in a higher power to guide the situation as there's little I can do at this point. I'll return to provide. Results after submitting DNA samples. We received our testing kits in early February and sent them in on February 13, but we still haven't received the results. Given my situation, I'm anxiously awaiting the outcome, and I'm starting to worry that there might be an issue. My husband reached out to the company, and their response has been that the results and report are in progress. My daughter mentioned that her sister-in-law received results in less than a month. In contrast, it has now been over six weeks for us. Is it possible that the delay is due to a lack of a genetic match between my husband and daughter? I'm feeling incredibly stressed about this situation. Update. I'm here to provide an update on the outcome of our genealogy test. The good news is that my husband is indeed the biological father of my daughter. As I mentioned in my previous update, I had been extremely anxious ever since my daughter brought up the idea of testing our family's genealogy. During this period, I had trouble sleeping and had little appetite I decided to cope with my anxiety by taking long walks with my grandchild in the stroller, sometimes even doing this twice a day. Surprisingly, this challenging time led to a significant weight loss of 19 pounds. I've maintained my walking routine and improved eating habits since receiving the results. And I've now lost a total of 26 pounds. I'm feeling great, and my husband appreciates my new figure. I'm also back to getting restful sleep. Now let's get back to the day we received the results. We had just finished dinner and were tidying up when my husband went into the bedroom to check the computer. He returned and informed us that the results had arrived. He planned to call my daughter to come over so we could all examine them together as a family. Upon hearing this, my heart raced so fast that I almost fainted. I had to excuse myself and went to our master bathroom where I sat down trying to regain my composure. I was so overwhelmed that I considered calling my husband fearing I might be having a heart attack due to difficulty in breathing. After some time in the bathroom, I lay down for about 10 minutes until I heard my daughter in the living room. I then went out to greet her and rejoined my family. Now it was time to reveal the results. My husband instructed our children to bring kitchen chairs into our bedroom, where he planned to display the results on the wall using a projector. We've used this setup before for family movie nights, so it was a familiar scene for us. However, this time I was on the brink of collapsing due to the anxiety. The first file my husband opened was my daughter's, and it confirmed that I was her mother and her father was indeed her biological father. In that moment, I felt like I had an out-of-body experience, it was as if I had been touched by a divine presence and a sense of calm washed over me while my heartbeat returned to its normal rhythm. 
Finally, I found peace, and I silently expressed my gratitude. After receiving this news, I had a great time reading the results and discussing our family's lineage with our children. We all enjoyed ourselves immensely. It was a day that will remain etched in my memory for the rest of my life. This was the day I was freed from the personal torment I'd inflicted upon myself due to my careless, selfish, and sinful actions over 21 years ago. Now let me address a couple of questions I've received. Why did I do it? To be completely honest, I had doubts about my husband back then. You see, I was only 18 when we started dating, and he proposed after just five months. I could have said no and asked to wait, but I was worried that he might move on and find another woman because he had a promising future ahead of him. In our culture, there's a tradition where women marry men who are at least four years older as it's seen as a solid foundation for building a strong family. As our wedding date approached, my uncertainty grew. Then one day, when my father-in-law, Phil, and I were alone in his office, it happened. It wasn't because I had romantic feelings for my feel. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Looking back, I believe it was his aura of being a it in someone like me, a young woman with self-esteem issues and no clear future prospects. At that time, my husband wasn't established, strong, or confident. He was just a young impulsive guy trying to find his way. Everything changed once we got married because I quickly fell deeply in love with my husband in every possible way. And that love remains unwavering to this day. I can genuinely say that I've never even entertained the thought of another man's my husband and I tied the knot and began building our family. In fact, with all the kids we have, I wouldn't even have the time for it. Not that I would want to. I'm genuinely afraid of losing him because he embodies the same strength, power, and confidence that his father did 21 years ago. I'm also aware that he could have his pick of a dozen or more young women in our community. That's why I was so anxious about receiving these genealogy test results. I concocted scenarios in my mind of him divorcing me and starting a new family with a beautiful young woman. Now on to the big question. Will I ever confess the affair to my husband? No. I won't. As long as we both live. My plan is to disclose it and seek forgiveness in the afterlife if the Almighty grants me that opportunity. If I were to confess now, it would only bring about his mental anguish shatter his relationship with his father and end our marriage. I understand that harboring such a terrible secret is difficult, and many of you may be upset with me. Nevertheless, I've found peace with this decision and pray for forgiveness multiple times a day thank you for accompanying me on this challenging journey. I wish all of you a blessed and happy life. All right, that was a fun story. Now let's move on to another exciting one. Stay tuned and let's dive in. Hello, everyone. I'm a 35-year-old man, and I was married to my ex-wife, Emily, who is 30 years old for four years before our relationship went sour. Emily and I first crossed paths at a bar where she worked as a bartender. My friends and I were regular patrons of that bar. And from the moment I laid eyes on Emily, I was smitten. She had a unique charm that set her apart from her co-workers. Despite my feelings for her, I kept going to the bar without expressing my emotions or letting her know how I felt. One evening while we were at the bar, Emily was serving at the the table next to ours when a man made inappropriate advances towards her, causing her embarrassment. I came to her defense, confronting the man and demanding that he apologize to Emily. Some others who had noticed the situation joined me in admonishing that man. Eventually, the bar's security personnel stepped in and removed him. Later that evening, Emily and her boss came to our table with a complimentary drink to show their appreciation. I continued to visit the bar and Emily and I soon became friends. Our relationship evolved from being bar buddies to me asking her out on a date to which she agreed. Emily and I dated for a year before tying the knot. A few months before we got married, I helped Emily secure a better job so she wouldn't have to work at the bar anymore. I did this because even when we were dating, 
I noticed how other men treated her when we went to the bar together. I felt uneasy about the way some men stared at her and made advances. So with the assistance. Educational qualifications. She had completed high school and attempted community college for a year, but financial constraints forced her to take a break in work. On my part, I worked as an assistant lecturer at the university while pursuing my master's degree. Emily's educational background didn't matter to me because I loved her deeply. I even secretly saved money for her college education, planning to reveal it when there was enough. Beyond her lack of formal education, Emily was street smart, hardworking, and open-minded. She was always willing to explore new opportunities and eager to learn. Her open-mindedness and willingness to acquire new skills were qualities I admired most two years of our marriage. We were happy and cherished each other's company. However, there was something that occasionally troubled me. At the start of our marriage, I didn't pay much attention to it. But as three years passed without Emily becoming pregnant, it began to weigh heavily on my mind. While we were dating, Emily and I discussed the number of children we wanted and even had their names picked out in advance. We both agreed on having two kids, and the gender didn't matter. Whether it was two boys, two girls, or a boy and a girl. What was most important to us was having our first child within the first or second year of our marriage followed by the second child a few years later. It seemed like the perfect plan, and I eagerly anticipated it. I envisioned a scenario where my first child would be at least 14 years old when I turned 50, and the second child would be around 10 or 8 years old. However, I became concerned as the first two years of our marriage passed. And we were approaching the end of the third year without Emily getting pregnant. Emily knew how much I love children and that I was committed to the plan. But at times, she gave me mixed signals about starting a family. We underwent a series of tests, tried various medications, and even explored fertility treatments. All the tests indicated that we were both physically healthy, but I couldn't understand why Emily wasn't able to conceive. I wasn't even confident in the results from a single hospital, so we sought multiple opinions and the outcomes were consistent. As our third year together came to an end without a child, it began to weigh heavily on me. I had experienced disappointment in other aspects of my life, and I never imagined I would also face disappointment in the realm of starting a family. By the third year of our marriage, the connection between Emily and me was slowly eroding. We didn't spend as much time together as we used to, and many aspects of our relationship had changed. Often, our conversations would drift towards my eagerness to have children which became a major turnoff for Emily. She began to voice her dissatisfaction, saying that I was more focused on the future than on enjoying the present. Shortly after celebrating our third anniversary, I realized how distant we had become. I made a promise to Emily that we would revert to the couple we once were and I would no longer obsess over the idea of having children. I didn't want to miss the chance to grow together with Emily. She expressed her happiness and reassured me that children were a blessing from God. And when the time was right, we would be blessed with them. I knew she was correct. As devout Christians, both of us believe that God was the giver of all good things, including children. We trusted that when the time was right, He would bless us with kids. I also kept reminding myself that our worth as a couple wasn't defined by the absence of children. With this newfound perspective and mindset, I let go of my worries about having kids. I started seeking new ways to rekindle our marriage and save her life with Emily. I had reached a point where it no longer concerned me whether we had children in the future or not. I even entertained the thought of adopting a child if Emily couldn't conceive. Meanwhile, during the third year of our marriage, Emily had already begun a four year college program. She was in her first year and I was financially supporting her with the savings I had set aside. She was making excellent progress, and I was delighted that she could pursue her college dreams. As time passed, our marriage gradually returned to its previous state. The only difference was that Emily and I weren't as close as before due to our busy schedules, 
If she wasn't studying late at night, she would come home late from work, and I had my own demanding commitments. Deep down, I understood that there would be times when we'd both be occupied and I didn't make an issue of it. I made an effort to be a supportive husband. When I returned home early, I would prepare dinner. Handle chores like taking out the trash and cleaning the house and do whatever I could to ease her stress. On weekends, I encouraged her to rest while I took on responsibilities like house cleaning, grocery shopping, laundry, and cooking. In the evenings, we'd go out for entertainment or take leisurely drives around the city. A few months after I had stopped discussing or mentioning children in our conversations, I noticed that Emily was still visiting her gynecologist regularly. She went for appointments at least once a week, which was even more frequent than before. I considered asking her about it, but I understood the reason behind her visits to the gynecologist. It would have been unwise and insensitive to inquire so I refrained from doing so. I believe that Emily wanted to proceed at her own pace, and there was nothing wrong with her continuing these visits. I actually admired her commitment to maintaining these appointments even though we had stopped discussing children. It deepened our connection. In the early days of our marriage, our intimacy was frequent, happening two or three times a week. However, as our attempts to conceive were unsuccessful, there were weeks when we didn't engage in intimate activities. But as Emily became more focused on her gynecologist, our intimacy increased to at least once or twice a week. Most often, it coincided with the days she returned from her appointments. I always welcomed this thinking that perhaps gynecologist had recommended it or that she was exploring something new. I never questioned her actions and made myself available whenever she desired it. Besides my desire for us to have children, this heightened intimacy strengthened our bond and improved our relationship. This pattern continued for months. With our increasing intimacy, my hopes of having a child grew even though I never vocalized them to her. I secretly hoped that one day she would excitedly announce her pregnancy, but that moment never came. Looking back, I'm grateful it didn't happen. If I hadn't uncovered the truth at the right time, I might have been raising another man's child now. Throughout the months, when Emily was regularly visiting her gynecologist, I had no idea that she was cheating on me with the same gynecologist I held in high regard. He was in his late forties, and I had even contemplated visiting him to express my gratitude for his unwavering support of Emily. He had been recommended by one of her aunts who had struggled with infertility for years, but finally conceived and had a child with his assistance. However, my world came crashing down two weeks ago when I stumbled upon something suspicious. It was a restless evening, and I was in the bedroom, struggling to fall asleep after a long exhausting day at work. I was too tired to prepare dinner or carry out my usual tasks, so I headed straight to our bedroom undressed and climbed into bed. Before Emily returned home, I had drifted off to sleep, but the sound of her car pulling into the driveway woke me up. I'm a very light sleeper, so I was fully awake. Although my eyes remained closed as Emily entered the room, I suspect she thought I was asleep, so she continued talking on her phone. When she hung up, she said, I love you. See you tomorrow after work. I lay frozen in bed, my mind racing to figure out who she was talking to. It was clear to me that it wasn't any of her siblings or parents because Emily wasn't typically expressive with her emotions. I stayed in bed while she went to prepare dinner. And approximately 35 minutes later, I emerged from the room pretending to have just woken up. I knew Emily was intelligent so I had to wait in the room for an extended period to ensure she wouldn't suspect that I had overheard her conversation. My plan was to wait for Emily to fall asleep and then secretly check her phone to find out who she was talking to. Honestly, my concern wasn't whether she was talking to her best friend or another woman. I just wanted to ensure she wasn't cheating on me or keeping secrets from me. Later that night, after Emily had dozed off and started snoring, I took a look at her phone. The most recent call was to her gynecologist. I couldn't believe it at first. So I decided to dig deeper by examining her text messages and WhatsApp conversations. Emily wasn't much of a social media user. Besides LinkedIn, she was primarily focused on building her professional network. 
WhatsApp was the only social app she had. As I went through her WhatsApp messages, I noticed that she exchanged more messages with her gynecologist than she did with me. In fact, our chats were minimal mostly filled with lists of groceries we needed at home. We used it to keep track of what items to buy on our way back home. To understand the timeline of their relationship, I scrolled back to the beginning of their chat. I was so shaken by what I found that I even went to the living room to reread their message. It was difficult to accept that Emily had been cheating on me for nearly seven months. I felt lost and didn't know how to react. I was furious with Emily for jeopardizing everything we had built together. She didn't seem to fear that I might end her college sponsorship due to her infidelity. After I had shed some tears and soothed my swollen red eyes, I took screenshots of their entire conversation. Starting from when they began dating, and sent them to my own. Community about people who had faced similar situations. The next morning when she woke up, Emily noticed that my eyes were swollen and asked about it. I quickly made up an excuse saying that I had been watching a very emotional movie all night and ended up crying. She laughed it off and didn't press the matter further. She had no idea that I knew about her affair, and I decided not to act suspicious. Despite what I had discovered on her phone, I still wanted concrete proof that Emily was cheating on me with her gynecologist. So that evening, I left work early. Drove to the fancy restaurant where she worked and parked my car a couple of houses away from the restaurant. I knew she didn't have any classes that day. As she had mentioned before leaving in the morning. Around 7 p.m., Emily finished her shift, and I watched as she left the restaurant and drove away. I followed her to the hospital where I saw her park in the hospital's parking lot and entered the building. I waited for a few minutes before following her inside. It turned out that she had an appointment scheduled with her gynecologist. I had to tell the receptionist that I was Emily's husband and that she had left her phone in the car. And I wanted to give it to her before she left. It was the only plausible and believable excuse I could think of. The receptionist directed me to the gynecologist's office, and soon, I was on the same floor where Emily was. I knew what was happening between Emily and her gynecologist and I realized that our marriage would never be the same after that day. So before I confronted them, I decided to turn on my phone's video recorder. Without making a sound or knocking, I quietly opened the door and entered the room. As I had suspected, I found Emily lying on the examination chairs, which had been adjusted down, engaging in an intimate encounter with her gynecologist during hospital hour. I made sure to record it as evidence to ensure that neither she nor the judge could dismiss it as a routine examination given the nature of the gynecologist's profession. The moment I entered the room, Emily saw me, and her face turned pale. She quickly pushed the gynecologist away, who appeared both scared and confused when Emily informed him that I was her husband. I didn't create a scene or raise my voice. Instead, I stood quietly by the office entrance, recording the video, and then calmly walked out. Their reactions confirmed that it was not a legitimate medical examination but something inappropriate. Emily chased after me, partially unclothed. When I reached the elevator to descend to the ground floor, she begged me loudly to listen to her. Her pleas attracted the attention of people in the vicinity who came out of their rooms and offices to see what was happening. I had to pretend to be composed when interacting with the secretary on my way out. And I drove back home. Once I arrived, I sent Emily a text message informing her not to bother returning home. I subsequently changed the locks to my house. For the past two weeks, Emily has been bombarding my phone with calls and messages, but I chose to maintain my distance to clear my thoughts. Aside from sharing the situation here, I haven't confided in anyone about her infidelity and it's causing me considerable internal turmoil. I've come to the decision that I no longer want to salvage our marriage. However, before we proceed with a divorce, I want to make her understand the pain she has put me through and hold her accountable for her actions. I'm feeling incredibly conflicted at the moment and unsure about the best course of action. Any suggestions or advice would be greatly appreciated.
Update 1. I'm still in disbelief over Emily's actions. Especially considering everything I did for her. Emily was always my top priority, and I consistently placed her needs before my own. I had the opportunity to invest in numerous expensive courses to better myself, but I chose to forego them to support Emily's college education. I invested all my savings in sponsoring her. The pain she has inflicted upon me runs deep, and I doubt I'll ever fully recover from it. One member here suggested that I play along with her for a bit and make her face public humiliation before serving her with divorce papers. I believe this might be the best course of action. Additionally, I've made the decision to cease all financial support for her education. If she wishes to continue college, she can do so with her own limited earnings. Three days ago, I finally answered Emily's call after weeks of not communicating with her. During our conversation, she broke down in tears and begged me to allow her to come home so we could talk. I anticipated this request, so I agreed to her coming over. She arrived at my place just 15 minutes after our call ended, and I granted her entry. I wanted to ensure I came across as genuine, so I calmly expressed my feelings and disappointment when we talked. She got down on her knees and offered her apologies. Emily admitted that she didn't understand what had come over and vowed it wouldn't happen again. She even pledged to cease meeting any gynecologist alone if I granted her a second chance. She explained that the gynecologist had manipulated her, telling her I was impotent and that she needed his assistance to conceive. I questioned why she didn't discuss this with me when the gynecologist first planted the idea in her mind. She told me the doctor advised against telling me, citing concerns about hurting my male ego. Part of me wanted to believe her, but I also knew she wasn't that naive to fall for such manipulation. I must admit I shed tears that day once more. Seeing her brought back the pain I felt when I caught her in the act. After she pleaded for forgiveness, I outlined my condition for reconciliation. She must confess her infidelity to both our parents and reveal how I discovered her betrayal. Upon hearing this, she paused, gazed at me, and broke down in tears once again. She asked if there was any alternative, and I informed her that this was the only way. I expected her to refuse, but she didn't. She expressed her willingness to do whatever it takes to repair our relationship. We've scheduled dates to visit both her parents and mine for dinner. Following that, we'll gather all her close friends. And she will personally confess how poorly she has behaved as a wife. It's my way of penalizing her for her actions. I'll provide another update soon, and I'm eager to witness her reaction when I hand her the divorce papers. I've already reached out to a lawyer and he's in the process of preparing the documents. Update 2. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to announce that Emily followed through with everything we had agreed upon. However, before I explain how it all unfolded, I want to let you know that Emily and I are officially divorced. Yes, I stuck to the plan. And she faced the consequences of her actions. Now about Emily confessing openly to everyone, we began by visiting her parents' house for dinner. They seemed delighted to have us over, but could sense that something was amiss with Emily. To be honest, she looked miserable, and her distress was quite evident. During our meal, Emily suddenly announced that she needed to share something important with her parents and siblings who were present, and it immediately grabbed everyone's attention. Out of nowhere, she burst into tears, her voice quivering, and confessed to her parents that she had been unfaithful to me with her gynecologist. And I had discovered her infidelity. Her parents and siblings were utterly shocked by her revelation, and they were taken aback. All eyes turned towards me but I remained composed continuing to eat. Only her father raised his voice and began berating her. The rest of her family was left speechless. The more her father yelled, the harder Emily cried. Once I finished my meal, we left together in an uncomfortable silence filled the room. Nobody said a word, and it was an incredibly awkward situation. I'm certain her parents were bewildered to see both of us arrive and depart together. The following day, we visited my parents' house, and Emily shared the same confession with them. My parents found it hard to believe. 
they had always known Emily as a composed and reserved person. And her actions seemed out of character, which we found somewhat amusing. Their disappointment was evident, but they left the final decision to me. After we had met both sets of parents, I felt content with the outcomes. It was clear that her parents were deeply disappointed in her. Their expressions spoke volumes. As we headed back from my parents' house, I dropped her off at the motel where she had been staying since I discovered her infidelity. She expected me to take her back home, thinking we could restart our life together. Instead, I asked her to return to the house the next morning. When she arrived, she found her belongings neatly packed on the front porch. It was a shock to her as she had anticipated a reconciliation. Upon entering the house, I handed her the divorce papers, which brought her to tears. I informed her that our relationship was over and my intention was solely to impart a lesson. In that moment, she became agitated and started shouting at me for ruining her life. She even claimed she had slept with her gynecologist as a favor to me, asserting that she believed I was impotent and incapable of fathering children. It was ironic as I wasn't impotent at all. To taunt her, I questioned why she hadn't conceived yet given her apparent fertility, and this visibly angered her. She lashed out hurling objects at me, filled with anger. I promptly kicked her out of my house, and we finalized our divorce a week later. Regarding the gynecologist who was involved with Emily, I shared the screenshots and video I had captured with the hospital management. I also posted this information on social media, explicitly naming the doctor and the hospital. This had serious repercussions for Suspension for engaging with a patient during hospital working hours. Emily couldn't even go back to him since his marriage and